Today we're talking about the war in Afghanistan, U.S.-Taliban relations, where the war went wrong, and various other things regarding the war. This is going to be pretty informal, this is going to be pretty unedited because I don't have a lot of time, and so hopefully you'll just take it as a podcast and you'll listen to it and you'll like it for that. Uh, if you know me from my TikToks, you'll know that I take fact-checking very seriously because I don't like being wrong ever or being told that I'm wrong. Uh, but for this, is going to be very informal. What I'm going to tell you, I believe to be true. I've read quite a few books on it, listened to a lot of panels on it. Oh, I'm setting this up like it's a conspiracy theory, but that's not my intention. What I'm basically trying to say is don't expect this to be in any kind of order or for every single detail to be exact. Um, also, this is probably going to be a collection of anecdotes uh, rather than a uh, thorough story. You know, uh, we I think everyone knows the story of Afghanistan, but I've learned quite a few anecdotes like behind the scenes and regarding decision making. So take it as that. Um, so I'm sorry if it seems kind of incomplete or jumps around a little bit. It's really not my intention. Uh, but so don't cite this in your research papers. Think of this as just two friends chatting, but I'm the only one who talks. Honestly, if you ask me real friends, they'd say that's usually how it goes anyways. Anyways, you aren't here to hear the Bencast. You're here to hear about the war in Afghanistan and my diatribes related to it. So before we jump into it, remember to like it if you like it and subscribe. Also, please let me know if you have any feedback uh, or if you want me to do more of these. Also, it's important to note that when it comes to this topic, people get hot fast. They get mad. They think I'm making excuses for the Taliban or whatever. I'm not. Don't misinterpret explaining for justifying. So in 2001, President Bush gave this big speech to Congress laying out the war that was ahead, and in it, he basically addressed the Taliban and says, the door isn't closed, you can still hand over Osama bin Laden and close terrorist training camps. As we know, the Taliban would not end up doing that. In my search for why 20 years later, uh, you know, I'm only 24, so I don't really remember, I kept running into the same reason, and that reason was that it would violate an old Afghan custom about kicking a guest out of your house when they asked for shelter. This reasoning frustrated me because... This kind of feels like some nonsense thing that someone like proudly repeat on Twitter or Reddit and be like, oh, here's the reason. But folks, that's the real reason. I kept digging for a different reason because it just seems so ridiculous when you look at the pure amount of destruction and death that came as a result of it. But that's the real reason. Advisors to Mullah Omar, Mullah Omar was the leader of the Taliban time. He was actually leader until 2013 when he died in a hospital bed in Pakistan. Um, it's a little weird, you know, because he thought he would have died before him. But he really, no, he lived out the rest of his life and died in a hospital in Pakistan. Uh, the U.S. was planning on drone striking him, actually, the night of the invasion, and they had the drone all ready to go. But something happened, and he got away. Anyways, his advisors were telling him, we will lose everything. Tons of people will die, and we will be crushed. Just give up Osama bin Laden. He's not even a good guest. And he just tells them, if that's what happens, then that's what Allah planned. Uh, you know, as an advisor, I can imagine that's a pretty frustrating answer. And his advisors were right. You know, there is no evidence that the leadership of the Taliban knew about the September 11th attacks until they happened. None of the hijackers are from Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden had brought them into this. Outside of a custom, they really had no obligation to bin Laden. What bin Laden did was like if you invited over your friend and they built a meth lab in your house and then called the police. Even President Bush's rhetoric suggested that he wasn't fully committed to a war against the Taliban. The U.S. wasn't going to let the Taliban off, but the shock and awe, Toby Keith, red, white, and blue, yeehaw response that happened on October 7th, 2001, definitely could have been avoided. If they had just handed them over, they could still be the brutal regime that they were beforehand. And don't interpret this as me saying that they're the good guys, that they're innocent. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that a pathway that didn't involve total destruction by the United States existed. And this is just the beginning of a very weird and very complicated relationship between the U.S. and the Taliban. For those who don't know, the Afghan Taliban are pushed out. They are native to Afghanistan. They don't do international terrorism. They have made threats in the past, but there has never been a serious plot or a threat made uh, they are different from the Pakistani Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Those guys are international terrorists. They're the ones behind the 7-7 bombings in the United Kingdom, 9-11, and the bombings in Spain. The U.S. very quickly defeated the Taliban. Uh, you know, I was four when 9-11 happened. I don't really remember the invasion of Afghanistan at all. Uh, I don't even think I was thinking about the wars until I was like a freshman in high school. And then I was like, wait, we're fighting two wars? But for the people who are my age or younger or older who need a refresher... We won the war in Afghanistan very quickly. A new government was set up, Karzai was made the president of Afghanistan, and there was a period of relative peace. You know, the Taliban was destroyed and Al-Qaeda was in Pakistan. Then the U.S. invaded Iraq, and they kind of just abandoned Afghanistan until the troop surge in the early 2010s. During this period of distraction, the war in Afghanistan had begun again. 
know, Pakistan had revived Director of S. Director of S was the codename for the operation ISI ran during the 1980s to help the Mujahideen defeat the Soviet Union. Of course, this operation was assisted by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the CIA. This had kind of become an urban legend, though. Uh, what actually happened was that the CIA gave money to ISI to give to the Afghan fighters, who would then go on to become the Northern Alliance. What I mean by urban legend is that the popular history of this event is that the CIA trained Osama bin Laden or that bin Laden was in the White House of Reagan or that the CIA created the Taliban. And it's a shame that so many people believe that when it's easily false. You can verify that it's false very, very easily. Um, and it also gives Osama bin Laden more credit than he actually deserves. He lied about his military record, and it was kind of a scandal inside al-Qaeda in the late 90s, early 2000s. Anyways, they revived Director S and started funding the Taliban. They saw the U.S. and India come together and strengthen ties, strive for further implementation, aim to give India a prominent spot as a U.S. ally, and Pakistan calls up the U.S. and says, we want the same. Uh, but here's the thing. I mean, Washington didn't say no, but I, they certainly didn't say yes. You know, since the Cold War, the two had been anything but allies, despite what they said publicly. For all intents and purposes, the U.S. viewed or views Pakistan as an obstacle that has nuclear weapons on its war on terror. Pakistan doesn't trust the United States either. Someone once said that the way to understand Pakistan's foreign policy is that every move is made out of fear and hate for India. Pakistan knows it'll never be viewed the same way India is in America's eyes. And that is true, but it's also kind of funny because for nearly 75 years now, the United States has been trying to tell India what to do and get it to do what it wants. And India just simply does not care. The two will most certainly get closer because of China, but the U.S.-India relationship is basically the U.S. finding a country that it was friendly with, that wouldn't follow orders, and the U.S. being completely and totally confused on how to work with them. So Pakistan saw Afghanistan becoming a stable country with a constitutional government and the full support of the international community, and it was developing close ties with India. The U.S. went and invaded Iraq, and Pakistan said, screw this, and started funding the Taliban and extremist groups heavily. If they can't control Afghanistan, then being in chaos is a good second alternative, I guess. And this is really the beginning of the end of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. The U.S. is giving billions to Pakistan humanitarian aid, government aid, and paying whatever prices they wanted to use the country for transit. In addition to that, the U.S. is really trying to push India to be kinder and less combative towards Pakistan, and the Pakistan started funding extremists who were killing and injuring American troops. Well, really, not even just American troops. I mean, just NATO troops in general, Canadian, British, Swedish. Um, and then Osama bin Laden was found in their country, and it's suspected that they knew that too. You know, from the American view, this was a betrayal. The U.S. never fully trusted Pakistan, as I said. You know, but this betrayal didn't shock Washington. Uh, after the President Bush warning of you're either for us or against us, I think Washington thought that the threat of an angry America was enough to stop Pakistan's shenanigans. And they were right. Pakistan was helpful and, for the most part, stopped all the shenanigans they had after 9-11. But by 2005, 2006, the U.S. wasn't angry anymore. It was just trying to juggle two wars. And I think that's when Pakistan began feeling comfortable enough that the U.S. wouldn't invade it. And that's when they went back to the shenanigans. To fast forward a bit, 2008 happens, Obama's elected president, it's a big moment for the United States and really for the world. The United States government would conduct a review as to why they were still in Afghanistan, and the conclusion was to eliminate Al-Qaeda and to prevent Pakistan's nuclear weapons from falling into the hands of terrorists. Al-Qaeda hadn't been in Afghanistan since the fall of 2001, they fled to Pakistan. So that's reason one, right? Now, reason two, the United States has never trusted Pakistan, especially with nuclear weapons. One of the reasons is that Pakistan funds extremist groups to expand its sphere of influence, and these groups are often engaged in combat with the U.S. So the worse the war in Afghanistan got, the more their terrorists would cross the border back into Pakistan, and they would be on the receiving end of terrorist attacks that they paid for. Now, this has led to a massive security crisis. Pakistan drives their nuclear warheads around defenseless delivery vans and population centers because they fear that Washington's more likely to take their nuclear weapons than extremists. Militants have attacked 15 of Pakistan's nuclear facilities 2,200 times, and that's a dated figure. That's from 2013. The number today is probably much higher. I will say on that exact figure, though, I can't tell you what constitutes an attack in that statistic. So take that with a grain of salt, but the general point is still holds true, and that is that Pakistan's nukes are unsafe. Now, this is something that annoys the hell out of Washington and Brussels and makes them extremely worried. In their eyes, Pakistan is clearly not secure, and they know it firsthand. You know, they snuck in in the middle of the night, crashed a helicopter, killed Osama bin Laden, then blew up the crashed helicopter all in the middle of the night in a residential neighborhood, and Pakistan was oblivious the whole time. 
You know, for a country that claims it's incredibly secure, that's not very secure. The Pentagon has plans to take Pakistan's nuclear weapons in the event that the country becomes destabilized. This is something the U.S. has had to do in the past. In the 90s, North Korea had sent out an illegal weapon onto a ship, and no one knew where it was going, and U.S. Special Forces disabled the weapon without leaving a trace. I've been trying to track down what exactly this illegal weapon was. I, I, couldn't, I can't figure it out, folks. There's only two mentions of it, and that is uh, in two autobiographies by Joint Chiefs of Staff, and uh, it doesn't, I don't think it was a nuke, but I mean, regardless, in the, it demonstrates the U.S. has experience in disabling uh, weapons that are potentially dangerous. Uh, so the U.S. concern over Pakistan's nuclear weapons existed before 9-11, though. Don't get it twisted. This isn't just, you know, after 9-11, oh, now we're worried about it. It's always kind of existed. I mean, Pakistan lied to the U.S. Congress directly several times, and they would, uh, you know, have senators come for lunch in Islamabad and, you know, show them fake, you know, nuclear sites, all this other stuff. I mean, they lied the whole time to escape U.S. sanctions. After President H.W. Bush, or George H.W. Bush, couldn't verify they, that they weren't a nuclear country anymore, you know, that's, they got hit with sanctions, and it wasn't until... 9-11 that those sanctions were lifted because the U.S. needed them. And I'm sure there are people who will say, well, we well, see, the U.S. penalizes you until they need you. And I guess that's true, but, you know, regardless, it was a right, they were righteous sanctions. I mean, they, they had an ally and they lied. But U.S. concern with Pakistan's nuclear weapons existed before 9-11, so much so that the U.S. used to conduct a beard review of Pakistan's military graduates out of a fear that a military coup could overtake the country. I couldn't tell you if they still do it, though. I imagine not. The relationship's kind of flimsy now, and I'm sure they probably got kicked out of the country. But Steve Cole describes a funny story in his book Ghost Wars, or maybe it's Director at S. I'm not sure. If you haven't read either one, I would suggest it. Direct Ghost Wars is about the U.S. involvement in Pakistan, or not Pakistan, Afghanistan uh, during the Soviet war, and Director S is about, you know, Pakistan, Afghan, and the United States, the little trifecta here in this prolonged war on terror. But Steve Cole describes a story in one of these books of a CIA operative who had done a yearly beard review of Pakistan's military graduates for several years before 9-11, and then showing up in 2002, and now he's not alone. You know, the ISI is also conducting one, and they got into an argument over whether or not short beards count as a sign of piety or were just fashion beards. But getting back on track, both of those reasons the U.S. government found weren't in Afghanistan, they were in Pakistan. And yet the U.S. kept fighting the Taliban for reasons the U.S. itself didn't know. It was there fighting a proxy war that was basically in a holding pattern. You know, General Petraeus said in 2017 that we went there for a reason, we stayed for a reason, to ensure that Afghanistan is not once again a sanctuary for al-Qaeda or other transnational extremists, the way it was when the 9-11 attacks were planned. But that's, you know, that's not the full truth. You know, the U.S. is ready to let the Taliban off. Maybe not fully, but there would have been consequences, but they were ready to let them off uh, if they had turned over Osama bin Laden and followed through on a few of their demands. Now, you know, obviously the Taliban was complicit in the attacks of 9-11, and the amount of politicians and generals who said they were going to defeat the Taliban is a mile long, but by 2010, the United States had realized the Taliban was just part of Afghanistan. National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes said the American military can do enormous things. It can win wars, stabilize conflicts, but the military can't create a political culture or build a society. And that's the understanding the Pentagon would eventually adopt. The war in Afghanistan fundamentally wasn't a war that could be won with bombs. It had to be won with a treaty. The U.S. completely destroyed the Taliban, like, nine times. Uh, but at the end of the day, you still didn't solve Afghanistan's problem. You know, the U.S. can't rein in ISI no matter how much Afghanistan complains about it. It's a generational struggle. Western Afghanistan will align with the Taliban, while the eastern half will align with the government. And America's reckoning with the truth has made Afghanistan a worse place. If it had put its best foot forward the entire time, it might not be in the situation it's in. The war was on autopilot, though, when it needed to be micromanaged. You know, there is no good solution for the U.S. here. It either stays for another 60 years, or leaves and potentially compromises its security. This lose-lose would give rise to a very contradictory relationship with the Taliban. The U.S. supports the Afghan government, but also struck a peace deal with the Taliban without including the Afghan government in the talks. And during the ongoing fight with ISIS, the U.S. military is working as the Taliban's air force against ISIS. You know, the Taliban isn't communicating with the U.S. Air Force. The U.S. Air Force is spying on the Taliban's communications and is striking ISIS right before the Taliban strikes. Most recently, it was found that the U.S. had made a deal with the Taliban to protect its military bases from other extremist groups. While the Taliban had held up their side of the deal and not attacked any NATO troops, they were still attacking Afghan troops. 
So now the United States is trying to come to grips with the Taliban in hopes they can influence it, while also trying to support the Afghan government. I'm not even sure what I'm saying right now makes sense because each statement seems contrary to the, the one before it, but the situation in Afghanistan, but really, you know, that is the situation in Afghanistan. It's a conflict of contradictions. Pakistan believes that funding the Taliban and putting Afghanistan in disarray will protect them from Afghanistan aligning with India. The United States supports the Afghan government, but behind closed doors, it strikes deals with the Taliban but also still actively attacks the Taliban. The war was about September 11th, but at a certain point, it became a proxy war of Pakistan, and I don't think Americans realized that. It was a war on autopilot with no strategy. And that's the end of this. You know, if you listen to this, thanks. Please give feedback. I really do apologize if it doesn't make sense. Um, I tried my best to explain a topic that is... Uh, very complex, um, but uh, I would if I had to recommend a recommended book, I would recommend checking out Steve Cole's Director at S. It's it's a tomb, but it really goes in deep um, into the failures of the war in Afghanistan and the fundamental misunderstanding by the Pentagon into why the war failed. Anyways, if you think this is a thing I should do more, let me know. Also, feel free to put constructive criticism in the comments. I'm always open to it. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe. Uh, talk to you later. Bye.